an elderly man, somewhere in his 70s. Imagine him with graying hair and a graying beard sits down to write a letter to some people that he is pastoring. His name is John. And as he writes this letter, he reflects back upon events that had happened some 50 years earlier when he was young and first called into ministry. We know this because he starts this letter that bears his name, 1 John, with a description about Jesus whom we knew and we experienced and we're testifying about him to you. And as he reflects back on the past, sometimes at the time when you are experiencing things, it seems like everything is important. But over time, you have a way of clarifying what really mattered about that experience. And so when he writes, he writes, let us love one another. For love comes from God. Now he was known and, and known throughout history and probably by the people he was pastoring as we call him the apostle of love. Because we read First John and it just drips with this message of love. But if he was here today and he was preaching to us, he might say, you know, I wasn't always that way. There was a time when I first felt called into ministry and I packed my bags and left the fishing boat with a hired man in the boat and went out and followed Jesus because he had said, come, I'm going to make you fishers of men, not simply fishers of fish. And so I left the would-be comfortable existence, my family business and did the crazy thing and packed my bags and went to Bible college. I wonder what Zebedee thought of all of that. Both his boys leaving the family business and going off to Bible college. And back in those days, he would have said, I was so filled with zeal and enthusiasm. Let me share with you a few of the experiences I had when I sat where you sit. When I was in my early 20s, I was third year. Of course, you graduate after three years with Jesus. We keep you for four because Jesus is a little bit better at it than we are. <laughs> so he's in his junior, senior year. And, and let me tell you about some things I did when I was your age. And then he would begin to reflect on those experiences and how he had gotten together with his brother James. And, and they, had, they had gone to Jesus to ask if they could get the best seats in the coming kingdom. All the disciples are kind of discussing this and arguing with each other, but James and John, they, they come to a Jesus and like, and guess who they recruit to help them? Their mother. So they were helicopter parents back then, Dr. Wooten. You know, calling up saying, hey, what, what, what's this grade you gave? My, how can you give my darling boy this grade? You know, or, And so they, they recruited mom to help them so they could have the best seats in the kingdom. They were doing it for Jesus and for themselves. You know, they worried about titles, positions, ambition. And then, then we ran across some people, and we heard this read earlier in the text. They were casting out demons, and, and they weren't really part of us, and they weren't part of our experience and our team. And so we, we had to tell them to stop that. You see, he's a driven individual who is very ambitious, and he always wants to win every argument he gets into. You ever meet anyone like that in the dorms? Right, every time there's a theological debate, so are you an Arminian or are you a Calvinist? Right, and all of a sudden, and I remember in Bible college, we had a friend and we nicknamed him Dr. Dogmatic because he could never be wrong. Right, it's, it, we'd be out in the hallway, it doesn't even involve him, he's supposed to be reading and studying for a test, and the next thing it runs out in the hallway and he's going to correct us on some minor detail. And so he silences these people who are casting out a demon. Earlier in Luke 9, the disciples had failed to do that. And then, and then there's those Samaritans. Those Samaritans didn't understand how to welcome Jesus. They were disrespectful. So I actually asked 
along with my brother James, Jesus, if we could call down fire and destroy them. They didn't really like the Samaritans all that much anyways. And Jesus rebuked us. What I want to do today is I want to look at how did John go from being a son of thunder to an apostle of love? And specifically, how did Jesus disciple his disciples? And how in this one passage, because we find that in Luke chapter 9, all three of the incidents I just alluded to are all mentioned. So we will want to look at not only the actions of John, but also what are the words of Jesus in Luke 9 that will help us to understand how he might be wanting to take us. With all of our ambitions, with all of our desires, with all of our hunger to be one and wanting to be with Jesus. And John would say he loves Jesus. He was on Mount Transfiguration. He's had encounters with Jesus that few people alive have had. And yet, Jesus still has to work with him. And how does Jesus do that in our lives? How does he disciple his disciples? How does he disciple John? And how might that serve as an example or model of how Jesus would like to disciple us deeper? Now Luke chapter 9 is an interesting chapter because it starts with sending out the 12 disciples. And then if you turn over to Luke chapter 10, you find him sending out 72 to preach. So what you have is a passage that's dealing with preparing people to do ministry. But in the middle of this, the part we're going to look at in Luke chapter 9, Luke zeroes in on discipleship. He's going to send them out. That's the whole idea. But this is the preparation time of getting them ready so they can go out and proclaim the message. And if they're going to be used to preach the gospel to a world, they had better learn how to reach the people next door if they're going to be able to do that. So what we want to look at is how does Jesus disciple John to take him from being this son of thunder to become an apostle of love? So to do this, I want us to look now at Luke chapter 9. And I'm going to go back into the text now in Luke 9. And in verse number 46, we pick up in Luke 9, 46, an argument that is breaking out between the disciples about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. This is where Luke is alluding to what we learn a fuller picture of from other gospel writers that James and John are like recruiting their mom to help them so they can get the best seats in the coming kingdom. And so in verse number 46, an argument started among the disciples as to which of them would be the greatest. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, took a little child and had him stand beside them. Now, why pick a little child? Because earlier the disciples had told the children, stay away. Jesus, really, you are not important enough. You don't matter. Jesus had to rebuke his disciples because they didn't understand that the priorities of the kingdom is that you got to care for everybody. Even the ones you think are the least. Like in the ancient world would be the little children. And so he says, whoever welcomes this little child, when you learn to love the least, right? When you welcome this little child, in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me, for it is the one who is the least among you who is the greatest. John was filled with ambition, desires, titles. He wants the best seat in the coming kingdom. Nothing wrong with ambition. It can be used the right way. He certainly loves Jesus, but he hasn't learned how to love others. Yet. 
This becomes even more apparent when we look at the next story that we find in Luke 9. In verse 49, John says, Master, we saw someone driving out demons in your name. Don't stop them. For whoever is against, not against us is for us. In other words, John's trying to win the argument. Well, you can win the argument, but you haven't really loved anyone. They're other. They're different from us. They, they're not credentialed to our process. and So we're going to silence them. We want to cut them out. It's a competition. And then comes the really big one we want to look at. And that is calling down fire from heaven on the Samaritans. You've got to imagine John has had a lot of voices speaking into his life. From the moment we're born, we all have this. Family members, society, friends, school, television, social media. All kinds of ideas that we end up Absorbing, sometimes without even realizing we're absorbing them. Things we start to believe that we never even question. They're like self-evident or axiomatic things in our minds that that's just how it is. John was raised that you could be deeply religious too and hate the Samaritans at the same time. He was taught prejudice. From the time he was young. He lived in Galilee. They would make the journey down to Jerusalem every Passover to celebrate the deliverance that Yahweh brought to his people all those years earlier. And while they're on their way, they are going under the eastern gate and they are singing the Psalms of Ascent and they're worshiping Yahweh and his greatness. And they have gone out of their way to avoid ever walking through Samaria. I think if John was here, he might say, look, I didn't treat the Samaritans any worse than anybody else. And he maybe, maybe he treated them better even than in some cases than some people. But he had absorbed a way of looking at the world that taught him that you could be religious and you could be prejudiced at the same time. Now, here's the thing about discipling someone. When Jesus wants to disciple his disciples and when he wants to disciple us, he's trying to disciple someone who's already been discipled. You've been discipled from the moment you were born by the world and by culture. We already have all the voices of our parents and our upbringing and everybody else that is crowding into our thinking. And so those voices are already there. So how do you now put in the message of the kingdom? If we're not careful, we just try to sprinkle it on top. We fit it in the gaps. You know, I remember reading a, a comment by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and he said, talked about the God of the gaps, and he was referring to science and how people are keeping God around for what science can't seem to explain, but that's just a totally inadequate worldview. And when we think like that, then we're going to end up cons consistently stumbling in our efforts of walking after Jesus. So this morning you might be saying, well, I, I don't know if I'm struggling with prejudice. I think sometimes we can struggle with that more than we realize, have blind spots. But that may not be the thing that you wrestle with. But, but this morning you may be deeply concerned about your physical appearance. You didn't get that from reading the Bible. You've been taught by your culture that your value really does depend on what you put on this morning or whether you lost a few more pounds. And you can almost hear the voice of somebody that you respect asking you if you started that diet yet. Or you may be hearing the voice of a father saying to you, when are you going to get a real job? We need to come back and start working the fishing business again. We, this thing is flourishing. We got hired men. I've, I've worked all my life. I want to be proud of you, son. I want you to do something with your life. The 
so we start to think that maybe the material comforts, and those voices, we begin to hear them in our minds. I don't think John ever thought of himself as being prejudiced. It's self-reflective. It's self-evident to him. It's just the way he was raised. Everybody does this. But you see what John is struggling with in each one of these stories is loving people. The son of thunder, he's got ambition, he's got drive. And understand, he loves Jesus. He's a good man. He wants to be a faithful disciple. He's a son of thunder who has to be turned into an apostle of love. Who's going to look back on life and say, I'll tell you what really matters. Love one another. Love comes from God. How do you get there? Let's explore this thing about the Samaritans a little bit more. And that is that on an earlier occasion, Jesus had been traveling. This would be the first year, so it's a freshman year for John. Right? This is the first year. And they're, and they're traveling through Samaria, and they had stopped off at a well, and Jesus had struck up a conversation while the disciples were off in the nearby village getting supplies. You know the story I'm talking about. And Jesus is sitting there, and he's talking to the Samaritan woman, and he's engaging in this lengthy conversation. And, and the disciples come back, and they got the food, and, and, they're, and, and they, they're like shocked. Like, for one thing, they're kind of like worried that we're going through this neighborhood to begin with because we spent our life going around this place. But now you're actually talking with a woman, and she's a Samaritan, and you're talking the theology. And the disciples don't say anything. They don't sing anything. But they're, it's awkward, the silence. And she picks up on that. She knows when the whole mood of the environment has suddenly changed. Someone who had been so welcoming, and now you have all these other faces looking at her. So she just takes off and goes back to the village. Meanwhile, Jesus is there with his disciples, and they're like, hey, here. We, we, we want to stop off at McDonald's. We did this as fast as we could. We didn't want to talk to anybody in that town, you know, but we got the food. We, got, we did it. Here's the food, and Jesus got not even hungry. Because I have a food you don't even understand. It's called the will of the Father. And they, you had just missed it. Because you've been in this town and they had shared and evangelized with no one. And Jesus says, oh, open your eyes. The fields are wide under harvest. And as he's saying that, I imagine the Samaritan woman is starting to bring people from the town back. And they can see them coming. And he's saying, listen, they were more ready for the gospel than you could have ever imagined. But you were so blinded by your prejudice that you couldn't share with them. When he says, open your eyes, for the fields are white unto harvest, he's talking about overcoming any kind of barriers we may have erected between us and those who are different from us. We know John was there because he's the one that wrote about it in the fourth chapter of his gospel. That was freshman year. It's quite a class he'd had with Jesus. Now he's in his junior year. And what is he wanting to do with the Samaritans? Call fire down from heaven. And these are the people who are supposed to take the gospel to the world. The passion's good. The son of thunder, the, the drive is important. Jesus wants that in John. The fact that he's so set on truth and it's absolute is something that Jesus does not want to water down. He's not trying to change the basic temperament of John. Because when you read 1 John, John talks about light and darkness. And if the love of the world is in you, the love of the Father is not in you. He's still very much, it's black and white. He's not become a compromiser. That's not what he's trying to do. He's learned how to take that truth 
that he sees so clearly and wrap it in love. He's learned to take the, the, the passions and the desires that, that sometimes conflict within his mind and heart that are for Jesus, for himself. He can't always know the difference between them. He's learned how in his later years to channel that into let us love one another. Because love is from God. So how in the world are we going to take this son of thunder? I'm, like, I'm not sure I like John right now. <laughs> and turn him into an apostle of love. Jesus called him knowing all these things about him. Knowing all the voices in his head. Knowing all the things that Jesus called him anyways because Jesus knew who he could become. Jesus' nickname for John was Son of Thunder. If Jesus was here, what nickname would he apply to you? What name would he give you? Son of Thunder is more of a description. It's not really good or bad. It's just a description. This is what you are. You're a Son of Thunder. But he made him one of his three. Of the twelve, he made him one of the three. And then Luke 9 records it. He took him up on Mount Transfiguration with him. Because he wants John close to him. He's got some work to do. While he's in Bible college. Right? If Jesus could show up in your dorm room, there's the kinds of conversations he would probably have with you. What's going on in your mind? Are you still living by the dictates of culture and the things that people have put in your head? That when, you, when you're worried about your appearance, when you're worried about trying to distinguish yourself from those who are others, when you're worried about money, when you're worried about all these other things all the time in your image and your position and your title and all the things that seem to matter so much to the world, you are weary and worn out and tired and exhausted because that's what the yoke of the world does to you. But take my yoke. It's light. It's well-fitted. It's designed for the temperament you have. You'll find rest. Sometimes we try to wear multiple yokes. <laughs> Boy, is that ever fun, right? <laughs> I'm going to do this. No, I'm going to do this. <laughs> I remember, when, I, when, I, when I first got saved, uh, you know, I was a kid growing up in, in youth group and all that. I was like, I, I, I knew I wanted to go to heaven. I mean, that, that other place, there was no way I was going to go there. So I, I'm gonna, I want to go to heaven. And, uh, and, and so I was saved. I was not sure about Jesus was my savior. That was clear to me. Uh, but I wasn't so sure about his lordship thing. Right? You had to wrestle with that one. Like, I didn't even tell you, you know, you've made him your savior. Can you make him your lord? You know, and like... Well, I'm thinking about him wrestling with it. But the thing was, I, I, and I wasn't like a crass sin or anything, but I thought there's some sinful things that look kind of fun. I, I might want to, so I don't want to really miss out on some of those things. So right now, I'm just going to put off the lordship part of this, right? I got my ticket to heaven because I, I did the whole, I prayed, I the whole a bunch of times, in fact, because I was a preacher's kid. So I'm, I'm good with that, right? But the lordship thing, you know, I'm not really quite so, so sure of. Right, and uh, and so I, I I made the mistake of thinking that Jesus had said, um, "Follow me, and then someday take up your cross." But that's not what he says. In Luke chapter nine earlier, he had told the disciples he's going to die, and he says, "Take up your cross." You don't really start following me until you get over yourself. Because until that time, you're still following your own desires and your own ambitions and your own agenda. And your own, you're, you're, you're saying it all in Christian-sounding language. I get it. It's wonderful, amazing. You've learned that, but we are not what we say. We are what we do. And John is revealing to us what's really inside of him. We look at his actions. So, how does he turn him from a son of thunder into an apostle of love. So what we want to do now is we want to listen to what Jesus said to them and what I think Jesus wants to say to us. Moving back to verse 43, the second part of verse 43 in Luke 9. 
While everyone was marveling at all that Jesus did, that is, he's just cast a demon out of a boy that the disciples could not deliver. He said to his disciples, listen carefully. In other words, don't get distracted by what everybody else get distracted by. It's wonderful. It's a great miracle. Yes, it changes that boy's life. But now try to focus on what I'm about to say to you. Listen carefully to what I'm about to tell you. Now, if Dr. Gallagher was here, we all know he's famous for, you know, write this down, right? <laughs> so it's like, that doesn't mean it's going to be on the test, but write it down anyways, right? So, but this is Jesus saying to you, listen carefully to what I'm about to tell you. The Son of Man is going to be delivered in the hands of men. And then, verse 45. But they did not understand what this meant. They didn't get it. Jesus, they, Jesus' mouth was moving. His lips were moving. Sounds are coming out of it. They could hear the words themselves. But when they put the words together, it didn't make any sense. Why was it they couldn't hear and really understand what he was saying? Well, sometimes my wife asks me, are you listening to me when we're in a conversation? I am a really bad listener. And I can tell you why I don't listen while well, my son is the same way. He's got the same problem, and we've talked about it. And, and the reason I'm not listening sometimes is I have other thoughts going on in my head. You ever have that? Right? You know, I'm already thinking about how I'm going to respond. I'm already thinking about what I want to do. I was on my way to do something, and now you're stopping and telling And right now it doesn't seem so important because I got all this other stuff. And so, and so she says to me in the middle of, are you listening to me? Now, I want you to understand that my failure to listen to her is not that I don't love her. It's not that I'm not committed to her. Oh, I'm a horrible person all of a sudden. No. I'm just distracted with other voices. And so she says something like, are you listening to me? So what do I do? I usually try to pick out a word that she used that I can remember. Yeah, you were talking about. <laughs> right? And then I try to like quote it back to her like somehow that proves I really was listening to her. And she's not buying it. She knows I really wasn't listening to her. I think something like that happens sometimes when we're in God's presence. And why is it this happens to the disciples? Because they have all those other voices in their head they've been raised with. They've already been discipled by culture. It's found in another passage, but it's a similar parallel kind of passage in Matthew 16. Jesus talks about going and dying, and Peter rebukes him because it makes no sense in their culture. A dying Messiah? No, deliverance from Rome. What do you mean? And Peter rebukes Jesus. And what does Jesus say in response to that? You have in mind the things of men. You're thinking like your culture, Peter. You, you said just a minute ago, I'm the son of God. You got an A in theology class. And you walked out of that. And you're still thinking like your culture's taught you to think and you can't hear what I'm saying listen carefully to my words because you don't have in mind the things of God you have in mind the things of men and it's killing you it's wearing you out you're trying to live up to all those expectations Jesus never put on you his yoke is light well fitted and it brings peace rest they did not understand what this meant verse 45 tells us it was hidden from them so they did not grasp it and then a final comment they were afraid to ask him about it 
It's almost like Luke is hinting that maybe they missed an opportunity. There were other times they would ask Jesus questions when they were confused by what he was saying. In this case, they, they didn't get it. It didn't make any sense. It didn't really register. It's the second time in this passage he's telling them this. But they didn't press in to ask questions. It's almost like he's inviting us as disciples and followers of Jesus to, to ask the questions. I have to understand your words, Jesus. I got to turn off the voices that are controlling the thoughts that race through my mind. I want to be alone with you, like Sarah sang. I want to be alone with you, Jesus. You can take the world. Couldn't have picked a better song. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. So how does how does Jesus seek to change John? Well. Listen carefully. He wants him to listen carefully. He wants us to tune out the world and the voices of men and everybody else and listen carefully. Read the text and say, well, what if he was saying this to me and not the Pharisees? What if I'm in their shoes? Listen carefully to everything that you find Jesus saying in the text with new eyes, putting aside the previous preconceived ideas and prejudices and just listen to Jesus. But there's something else he sometimes does when we don't listen. Because if we don't listen to him, we can't go deeper. You can't do a deeper work, we're not going to change. We're still going to be running around saying all kinds of Christian things, chasing our ambitions like sons of thunders do. So to understand this other thing that Jesus does, let's reconsider a story we've already mentioned. And that is when Peter or when James and John come to Jesus and they ask for the best seats in the coming kingdom. Jesus' response to them is not, yay, this is so cool, you guys want this. His response is, can you drink the cup? He's been talking about his cross. Can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? What does he offer him? A taste of suffering. It's kind of surprising. Suffering. Now understand, Jesus is not going to use suffering to change John. Suffering can change you, but it's almost always for the worse. He leaves you bitter, angry, frustrated. But there is something that Jesus can do with suffering that can be redemptive in John's life and in yours. You know, we live in a secular world where suffering makes no sense. It's just they say dumb things happen to people. Sorry about your luck. I mean, what a horrible thing to do to people when they go through suffering. No wonder they just find life so empty and meaningless. But we can see in this story how Jesus is wanting to use suffering. And what does happens when you suffer is it gets your attention. I mean, if I'm walking in my bedroom and I hit the edge of the bed with my little toe and it hurts, what happens to you in that moment? Ah, right? And you're like, owie, owie, owie. And it's my wife does that when she stubs her toes. You know, and, and when that pain hits... That's all you're thinking about. All the worries you had a minute ago, you're not even thinking about that. All you're focused on is the part of your body that hurts at that moment. And it's that little toe. I don't even know what its purpose is. I mean, why it's there, and now I just jammed it on this bed frame, and what a, oh. But when pain hits, you pay attention. Because he's saying, listen carefully. If you're not going to listen to my words, there's something else I can do to help you to listen. Now, it's not that it's his first choice. But if you can't listen to my words, there's something else we can do. There's a cup I'll let you drink from. I remember telling one young uh, minister who was, I was at another school, a very capable young man, you could just see all kinds of potential and everything else in, in him. I, he's going to be a great, pastor he's gone on he's done all kinds of wonderful things in ministry but I remember telling him I pray that you will have all kinds of success and just enough suffering to be really great because I could see underneath and he's an athlete he's he was very confident he was very not that that's bad it's not 
God uses that. Ambition's not wrong. But when ambition is married to pride, it's destructive. And what cures pride is suffering. Jesus is listening to him. He's like, yeah, I see what you want. Yeah, this is, you, you're ambitious. You're driven. You're a son of thunder. I called you because I need people like you in the kingdom. But what I can't let you do is marry your pride and self-sufficiency to your ambition because it will destroy you. So here is a cup. Because suffering teaches us, not only does it get our attention, but it teaches us that we can't do it on our own. I can't do it. God, help me, is what we cry when it hurts. Because it reveals that self-sufficiency and pride to be the straw man that it really is. We should have just crucified self. We should have just gotten over ourselves. But now this is happening. Not because he doesn't care. Because he really need to listen carefully to what he's saying so he can do a deeper work in your life. The thing about John is he, he really does change. If you, you take these Samaritans, if you, if you fast forward beyond the cross and the resurrection, day of Pentecost and so forth, there's a revival happening in, in Samaria that's recorded in the 8th chapter of Acts. <laughs> and who is it that ends up going to Samaria to follow up on the revival of the disciples? Well, John goes with Peter. And John ends up laying hands on some of these new believers and praying, Oh, God, fill them with your spirit. In other words, send the fire. Different kind of fire. I remember when I was pastoring a little inner city church, and someone came by and set my, my church on fire. So I called my dad and go, the church is on fire. And he goes, praise the Lord. I said, no, 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 no. Talking about a physical fire, the one that does damage, you know. We see him totally, he's changed. Now he's ready to go out and carry the message to the world because he no longer finds himself pulling back in awkwardness from people who are different or other from him. And we'd say, well, what made that difference? If we asked that to John, I think John would say, I had to. Stay close enough to Jesus to discover how much he loves me. There's a third name that I want to mention this morning. And that is the name John gives himself. Because in his gospel, he calls himself the disciple Jesus loved. The beloved disciple. So, he goes from being a son of thunder, the name Jesus gave him, to an apostle of love when he finally gives himself a name. I'm loved by Jesus. What name would you give yourself that would identify who you are? And I think this is John at the end of his life looking back and he's writing the gospel years later, reflecting on those experiences that happened all those years earlier. And he says, you know, this is what really made the difference in my life. And he, he writes his gospel that way to communicate this truth. Because you see, pride, I was talking with my son. It was a difficult conversation. He had been doing all kinds of drugs and whatever else. He was hurting. He was thin. And I was having a conversation with him, and I knew 
He was desperate to be loved. And I was standing there as a father who loved him so much. And I watched as this son of mine was, couldn't figure life out, was wrestling and reaching for the very thing I wanted to pour into his life. But he couldn't receive it. And the reason is because he was clinging to his pride. Because God resists the proud. Grace, he pours out to the humble. When you're proud, you're saying, I'm in charge. I'll earn it. And love is never something you can earn. As I stood there and looked at my son, I thought to myself, Heavenly Father, do I do this with you? The problem, surely, this morning is not that there's not enough love present. I was a student at CBC. One of my friends was Craig Keener. He's now a famous theologian. But he was doing some research, and I remember the day that he stopped by my room and shared with me what he had read about Romans 5.5. 5. It talks about the love of God being poured out. He said, actually, in the Greek, this is like the Niagara Falls. And I've always had that image in my mind of, of Niagara Falls of love. He just wants to pour. He wants to drench you with his love. There's so much love here right now, and you're so desperate for it. It's what your soul's crying for. It's what you're thirsting for. But if the problem is not that there's not love or that the Father doesn't want to pour it into us, it's that sometimes we don't know how. To let ourselves be loved. To receive the love. Because you receive the love when you set aside your pride. When you get over yourself. God says, if you'll take care of others, I'll take care of you. I'll pour my love in you. It's what John writes later. Let us love one another. For love comes from God. How many times at this altar have people cried out and walked away unchanged because they were still clinging to their pride? So John calls himself this disciple whom Jesus loved. I think he makes this decision that he wants to be as close to Jesus as he can, capture every word that he can. Maybe he looks back and remembers not having listened carefully when he was all those years earlier. And so as an, as an older man, he writes his gospel. He structures the gospel as a series of conversations that Jesus has with people. Because to him, that's how discipleship takes place. So when the first disciples encounter Jesus in John's gospel, Jesus simply says, hey, come hang out with me. And that's how it starts. It's a strange beginning, and yet then you just have a conversation with a Samaritan woman. You have a conversation with, with uh, Nicodemus. You have conversations until it ends, and the pinnacle of this gospel is this long conversation over a table called the Last Supper in the upper room, that last chapter. It's as though we're sitting there listening to Jesus. He says, I want to invite you in. Stay close to Jesus. Listen to his words. He structures the entire gospel as part of his message to drive home the fact this is how Jesus can change us. I think John decided I want to stay close to Jesus. So at that last supper, who is it that's laying his head up against his chest? And when Jesus gets arrested and all the disciples flee, and the only ones left at the cross when Rome and this imperial power is crucifying Christ. And the last thing you want to do is to be there in the presence of a dying, condemned individual with all the religious leaders watching and taking attendance. Well, not all the disciples fled. This group of women, they were called disciples back in Luke 8 when Jesus had talked about his 12 and the other disciples, and some of the, those women were there. 
The women's voices were the first ones at the cradle, the last ones at the cross, and the first to proclaim the empty tomb. At every critical moment in his life, he's using women's voices. But amongst those women is one disciple. John standing there. John, they're looking at you. John, do you realize they're marking you down? There's, these are the ones who crucified Jesus. Little they do to you next. He doesn't care anymore about that. He just wants to be where Jesus is. I got to stay close to you, Jesus. And he's standing there at the foot of the cross. I still believe in you, Jesus. It makes no sense. My whole world is rattled. My whole future is in shambles. I don't understand what tomorrow is going to be like. But in this moment, I want to be close to Jesus. And when Jesus is on the cross, he says seven words. Seven sayings. One of them is directed right to John. He says, John, take care of my widowed mother. Now understand, you do not entrust someone like your widowed mother to someone who doesn't know or isn't learning how to love. Jesus was saying to John, I see you standing there. You believe in me, but understand something. I believe in you. And I'm going to take something so valuable, this person who means so much to me, and I'm going to entrust her into you because I believe you're going to become an apostle of love. I know what your future looks like. I believe in you, and Jesus would say that to you this morning. You want to be close to me. You want to stay at the altar when everyone else is gone. You want to pray. You want to spend time in my presence. I see that you want to believe in me. And I know you've got baggage. I know you've got voices in your. I know your culture is trying to disciple you and bend you in their own way. But you want to be in my presence. I believe in you. He says, that's... As an old man, he's writing his gospel. He says, that's the name I want to be called, remembered by. John's just my birth name. The name I want to remember by is the one Jesus loved. Because when I understood that, when I understood that finally, it transformed my life. Suffering doesn't change you. It gets your attention. It reveals your weakness. It's love that will transform you. It's love that'll make you new. It's that Niagara Falls. He wants to pour into your life so you can go from being a son of thunder to an apostle of love. Because they want to love one another. Because love comes from God. I know the hour's a little bit late, but I want to end this service by offering you the opportunity to just spend some time with Jesus. I think it's been a theme in the sermons that have been preached. And certainly in the song that we heard sung just before this sermon, I think the Spirit is telling us that we need to spend time in His presence. And my prayer is that you will open up to experience His love in your life. Let Him pour it in change you. If you want to come down to the altar, you can. If you want to just stay in your seat where you're at, you can. I just encourage you to reflect for the next few moments and spend some time listening carefully to Jesus because he wants to transform your life. That's how he disciples his disciples. Listen carefully to him.